Thank you, Larry. Good morning. I hope everyone is having a good morning. So I'm uh, here on behalf of Internet Energy Solutions Canada and proud and honored to uh, have the opportunity to introduce our next guest, who will be presenting uh, Cold and Snow, Yet uh, No HVAC, how um, Bumschlager Berle Architecten's new head office um, is an inspiring call to action. So our guest is an Austrian architect, uh, Dimitri Berle, uh, who is a winner of over 150 national and international competitions and has been a teacher in several universities in North America and in Europe. Since 1999, he has been the professor um, at the ETH Zurich and has been the dean of um, the School of Architecture between 2003 and 2005. He has also been the head of the housing of the Center of Housing and Sustainable Urban Development at the ETH Zurich. The architectural practice, Baumschlager Berle, is a network of international offices run by Dimitri Berle together with 11 partners. The offices, located at 12 sites in eight different countries in Europe and Asia, have completed well over 400 buildings. Please help me welcome our next guest, Dimitri Berle. Good, afternoon. Good morning. I don't know if it's morning or afternoon or something in between, but nevertheless, a nice day. Uh, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for this uh, invitation to Toronto. I, I never had been in this city before. Even I was teaching not far from here more than 28 years ago at the Syracuse University. Uh, so my, I know a little bit the area and this connection. What, what I want to tell you is a, a very simple uh, story. During uh, the last uh, 25 years uh, in Europe and all over the world, the standards for how doing a building increased a lot. You know, and, and I think uh, one of the key issues which uh, made the performance of our buildings better is the development of the glass industry and the changing of technologies, uh, what we had there. And uh, the lecture is separated into three different parts. The first part is, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about, about our thinking so about uh, uh, energy and uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions and uh, green gas house emissions. The second part is, I, I want to show you a building uh, which is called uh, 2226, which means uh, the, the secret of the name is very simple. It says never under 22 degrees, never over 26 degrees all the year long. So, and this number is something which is very representing when we speak about buildings, what we think about, it's always about comfort. And uh, during the lecture, I will also talk about two other comfort levels very shortly. The one is the air quality in the building, uh, which means carbon dioxide. And the second one, the third one is humidity, relative humidity in the building. And uh, the second part is, I will show you this building. The third part is, I will show you projects where we use this knowledge to develop a new project. What is maybe very strange and what is maybe the most radical approach is that in these buildings you don't have any mechanical ventilations and you don't have any heating systems anymore. So in modern terms we say we replace hardware 
which I think is the old technologies, by software. But we are managing the buildings by software. But we have no additional uh, uh, devices for heating, cooling, or mechanical ventilation in the building anymore. So what I say is something very simple. We have to learn to use the things we have in a more efficient way. Make them more intelligent, and then uh, you will be able to maybe get rid of some of the things. I hope this works, yes. As an introduction, I, I want to tell you uh, a little bit about our understanding of buildings. When we speak about buildings, in the end, we speak about an overlapping of five technical systems which have very different lifetimes. And the lifespan of a building becomes a more and more key question when we speak about how to reduce the impact of buildings onto our climate, onto our change. So what we learned, and, and this, uh, what the numbers I give you here is based on a lot of research, uh, what I did at ETH um, during my ETH uh, period. So I asked myself, which parts of the building which will have which lifetime? You know? And so you know, there is one very big difference between Canada and Europe. In Canada, the density of population is 100 times smaller than in Europe. So you have a lot of space. We don't have space. We have to learn how to deal with this limited space we have. And the, lim the space is one of these uh, resources, uh, what we have to deal with. And, and you are very privileged in Canada, same as in Russia have a lot of space, not too many people, but a lot of space. And out of this understanding, you can answer certain questions very different than we have to do when we speak in Europe. So what we found out, what is the most important decision uh, which you do as an architect is how to bring, build up the relation of your building to the public space. What is the contribution of your building to the public? I know when you have a lot of space, you can go to the mountains, to the woods, to the lake. We cannot do. We have to learn and to uh, uh, come along uh, with each other in a, in a much more compact way. So the, the biggest decision, what you do as a designer, is to generate the situation of the building and the volume of the building. Because normally, these two decisions will have a lifetime of more than 100 years. You will not change this afterwards anymore. The second is you know, the structure. And uh, in countries like Switzerland, as an engineer, you are responsible for the quality of the structure for, by law for 100 years. Which means, as an engineer, when you do a decision and you are the son or the daughter of an engineer, be very careful if you want to, because all the things your father did is on your table afterwards. You know, so a very strange story, very strange. But nevertheless, the structure, the load-bearing structure, including the vertical distribution of the building, is the thing which should last at least for 100 years. And afterwards, you cannot change this irreasonably anymore because it's too complicated, too expensive, and things like this. The third one, which is very important, is the envelope of a building. The envelope normally has a lifetime of about 50 years. According to the economic ba uh, background of this decision, and nowadays the envelope is about 30% of the cost of the construction of a building. So the envelopes became more and more expensive uh, according to standards, according to technical developments during the last uh, 30 years. And then what we are trained in 
uh, what we are trained in, to, in architecture, we speak about function. You know, if it's housing, office, school, but the function is only a phenomena of one generation, which means 20 to 25 years. But when you want to do a building, what you should do, which has a much longer lifetime, then you have to understand that the function of your building will change anyway. You cannot change this. You know, so I always ask the stu students, do you really want to live like your parents? Normally students always say no. It's very reasonable. I, when I ask you as a uh, working, uh, in, in your working facility, do you want to work like 20 years ago? Normally no. The world is completely different within 20 years, how you organize uh, uh, people and works and, uh, you know, in, in a big company, the average lifetime of the spatial organization of the company is not more than five years. Because the new director has to change the organization and the spatial organization according to cooperation within the company. If he does not do this, they will kick him out. Very easy. So, in a lot, in, 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 for example, at this moment, we'll be experience quite a big uh, reorganization of teaching, of education, of children all over the world. In every country, we speak about new educational programs, new facilities. We speak about the changing of uh, going to school for a whole day for, uh, and things like this, which has a big impact. And you know, for example, I've spent all my life in universities. The only thing in a university you don't need anymore is a lecture hall. Because this is the most inefficient way of teaching students. So you do this nowadays in small groups, so you don't need big lecture halls anymore. You know, very strange uh, issue. So we change, I only want to show you, or you know, the most important, the, the most favorable example of this the changing the program are hospitals which are all never finished, they are always under construction because there is always a rapid development of new technologies, new knowledge, and things like that. So I could give you hundreds of examples, you know, how these things change anymore. So the question is, how can we do buildings when we understand that the program, which is always the starting point of the design, uh, has a very short lifetime, only one generation, but the building should uh, last for much more. And you know, the, the other thing is the, the surface of the buildings, uh, the, normally 10 to 15 years. You know? And you know, the problem what we have at the moment is a lot of times that the surfaces of the buildings, that's the same lifespan like the technologies which we put into the buildings. You know? So at the moment we try to save our climate by doing investments for uh, the machineries which has a lifetime of normally 15, maybe 10 to 15 years. Uh, maybe 10 to 15 years. So I think this is not a strategy to really answer the demanding questions what we have at the moment. You know? I think uh, our thinking is much more still related to just time spans of, uh, which are very short. But the, 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 the buildings, uh, they should uh, have once more this opportunity to become quite old. Uh, because, you know, I, I, <laughs> I tell you a funny story, you know, in, I, I was very much related to Switzerland, you know, and in Switzerland, in every country I learned that sustainability means something very different. In, when you speak about sustainability in Germany, they speak about innovation, new technology or something like this. When you speak about sustainability in Switzerland, they speak about one very clear thing. They want to keep the value of the investment as long as possible. 
the value of the investment is the sustainable things. Which, when we speak on a social terms, I think it is very reasonable that uh, all the big investment, all the big money we put into real estate, you know, is the fjord fortune of our children and the next generation, you know. So I think in a lot of terms, not only in uh, ecological terms, but also in social terms, it makes a lot of sense to think in a much more uh, different uh, time categories, you know. You all know this uh, book out of the 30s about time, space and architecture. And in this book, you we were used now and trained to speak about space and architecture, but we did not speak a lot of times about time. But to solve the problems, what we have now, to create a future for our society, is thinking about time. This is the key question to solve a lot of problems. You know all these uh, di diagrams uh, that's uh, the carbon dioxide uh, from the World Climate Council, the diagrams, and there you see that uh, that's a global, uh, there you see for buildings, for only the maintenance of buildings, you use eight, uh, 18, you produce 18.4% of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, gases. Okay, sorry. Uh, and uh, but you know, the, and you see, on the other hand, uh, for the production of building, you have this gray energy uh, for buildings. So all together, it's about at this moment about 31 uh, to 32 percent contribution of the building industry to uh, carbon dioxide emissions. But this is a global. Uh, numbers. When you break down these numbers to n high developed countries uh, like uh, for example m center of Europe, there the contribution is more than 60 percent. In the United States it is 72 percent. So 72 percent of the carbon dioxide emissions only relate for doing and maintaining the buildings. So when we speak about electrical mobility, everything is nice, but the number is very small. But we should start to speak about doing and maintain buildings. This is the big question. I can tell you uh, countries where it is 92 percent. It's Hong Kong. It's 92 percent. But in underdeveloped countries, this number is very small. So in a global, uh, in a global uh, uh, point of view, uh, the, it's only 32 percent. But this is only a, as soon as the others, like China or India or Brazil, they want to live as stupid as we live, the world will collapse very fast very, very fast, you know, and in absolute numbers it is very clear. Not they produce the problem, I'm really sorry, the high developed countries produce the problem because their output per capita is so much higher than all the developing countries at the moment, you know. So, but that's, uh, and you know all these numbers. There is a second issue I always want to talk about, this is a very stupid example. Uh, it's only a research in Austria. There, from 94 to until now, you see the, the, share, the difference between the average income and the cost for housing becomes quite wide. And this phenomena, that real estate becomes too much expensive for the incomes, I don't know it in Canada, but I know it all over the world. I can tell you this in China. I know the numbers, not in North America, but all the rest of the world I know. And there's always the same problem. So when we want to manage, uh, the f so I believe that these two questions, one case question is the cost problem, and the other question is the question of carbon dioxide, uh, uh, greenhouse uh, gases, the, uh, the distribution of green. So we have to deal with these two questions. And you know, I, I can show you an example of two buildings uh, which we did. 
the one, both of these buildings, they have one in common, that the clients wanted to have the most efficient buildings, and uh, uh, ecological buildings. The one client is the Munich Reassurance Company, maybe you know it's the biggest reassurance company in the world. So, and the other one is the ETH building uh, for uh, teaching and uh, laboratories. And there you see already only within uh, t uh, 10 years, a difference of the reduction of more than 50%. And when we speak about energy, we don't speak about heating, we don't speak about warm water, we speak about all the energy which you really use in a building. So all the electrical, uh, all the lighting, all the electrical appliances, all the machineries, the coffee machines, the refrigerators, <laughs> and everything what you, the elevators, everything what you need. So because for me it is sometimes very hard to understand how you can divide between heating and electricity. Because every kilowatt hour of electricity which you bring into a building is transformed into temperature. So afterwards to separate, I don't know how you do, you know, but I, this, must, you, this is only according to standards possible, but not in reality. Not in reality. I, I can show you a lot of buildings who have very low heating cost because they have very high electricity cost because they need a lot of electric, electrical lighting, for example, or things like this. So that's complicated. Now, the, the thing I want to show you, and that's a little bit the image I want to get, we don't need in uh, these traditional technologies anymore. And uh, therefore, I, I, I only... So I only wanted to give you a, a, this a climate diagram of the different uh, cities. And the building I will show you is situated in the green in the Lustenau area. And then on top you see Paris, London, Los Angeles. They all would be much easier to do there. Because the, clim uh, the climate, you see in Toronto, that's the red one, it's a little bit colder in winter. So you would need some more additional uh, heating in, in, in winter. But uh, when you will ask me afterwards uh, under which circumstances you can do this, what we, I will show you, I say all over the world you can do. Because there will always be a big impact on the performance of your building. But now the next uh, question is, you know, that's the way how I understand the building. You see, the blue line is always the outside temperature. That's the outside temperature of Zurich, you know? The green line is something estimated according to standard, what's the, the inside temperature. The red area is the area which shows you you have to heat. The gray area is the comfort level of 22, 26. The blue area is you need for cooling. And we were working, I, uh, look, uh, I had a, no, we were working uh, on this issue for more than 30 years, you know. And when you read a diagram like this, as an engineer you're interested in the red and the blue, then you know how big you have to do your cooling, how big you have to do your heating. But as an architect, I'm a lazy person. I was always interested in the, green, in, in the gray area because in the gray area, there I have to do nothing. The world was fine. <laughs> so and that's a little bit what as an architect I wanted to generate all my life. How can I do the things in the way that everything is perfect and you don't have to care about? You know, when I speak I, as, a, as an idea, I told you before that I, I'm very much interested because I believe in a long-term view only the things will be successful which will generate more comfort for the people, more comfort, you know, on, on the temperature level, on humidity levels, on carbon dioxide level, on, on, on architectural quality. So I'm always interested in comfort. 
And so we are, were working very long on these strategies. How can we optimize a building? You see that the areas where the temperature is in the gray uh, uh, dimension becomes much longer. As a natural result, the demand of heating and cooling becomes much less. I can show you once more only to compare. And that, that's a little bit what we are working on for. Now you will, and now I show you this one. That's what we do with 22, 26. And you see on the right hand side, no heating, nearly no cooling anymore necessary. But uh, I will show these uh, figures I, I show you on this chart is the measurement of 2018 in a, a time distance of 30 minutes, 30 minutes. Every 30 minutes it is measured, you know. And then the green line, you see, the, the green line is the inside temperature. It's always between 22 and 26, all the year long. The blue line is the outside temperature. And there you see areas where it is under minus 10 and things like this. And on, on, on the top, it's over 38, nearly 40 degrees. You know, now the, the first question is, how can you optimize a building? You know, how can you optimize? And I tell you, this is all related to the question of design. You know, so what, when we have a design, we try to start to calculate the design in different relations. And it's never an absolute number what you're interested in. It's always, every number is only important in relation to the floor area. Because the floor, the used floor area, that's where people are. All the rest is not interesting, you know. It's all, everything is focusing on people, on people. And people are represented here by numbers, I'm sorry about this. But uh, everything is related to uh, people. And that's what, the, the, you, you do a, you do a, a course for, uh, designing uh, to improve the building, that's exactly what I think you have to do, you know. Uh, that to increase the knowledge in design to generate better buildings which are more related to the local uh, backgrounds and circumstances, you know. In, in Europe, this is very comfortable because we have a lot of old tech buildings before 15th century, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century. And we have different typologies in different areas. And when you analyze them, you start to understand that these typologies are not related to the use of the building, because this changed anyway, but it was related to the local climate. You know, therefore, in the south of Europe, you see stone walls, small windows, deep. Win in the north of Europe, you see wooden structures, uh, very much orientated uh, to the south and things like this. Very funny. And somehow, in the 20th century, we lost this kind of knowledge. We don't know anymore what is the most reasonable uh, uh, what is the most reasonable ex what is the most reasonable access to uh, this question you know to optimize the relation of your building to the local climate because in all the 20th century modern architecture was related to a very different question it was related to optimize the function but not the quality of the area you do to optimize the function you know, so don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm a very modern architect and I like modernism, but this was only a time period of about 60 to 70 years where this was reasonable. What was the, mo the most important goal for modern architecture? It was something very simple. It was to generate uh, environment and to generate buildings which could be affordable for average incomes. 
That's the goal of modernism. And I think we have this kind of goal once more, once more in our times. So we can use quite a lot of this knowledge of modernism. But on the other hand, we learn something in, uh, in, in addition that the program will change within the building quite short, within one generation. And we cannot afford to tear down everything, uh, which we, at the moment we partly do, also in Europe. We, we tear down a lot of buildings from the 70s and 80s. The ecological balance is catastrophic. It's a real catastrophe, and we should not do this in future anymore. Therefore, our buildings have to be a little bit more intelligent. But that's optimizing a building is something uh, which should be uh, to, uh, teach, uh, taught in universities much more. But we have one problem. There are not that many teachers who know about these relations. So first we have to educate the teachers, and then the teachers can educate the students. That's a big problem, what we have at, at the moment. Okay, now I show you the building. The building is something very simple. It, it's a, an office, it's a, you see the, the, the site is an industrial site, and the building is a, about only 3,000 uh, square meter, which is about uh, 33,000 square feet. Uh, so the dimension. And I was very sure I could never uh, persuade a developer to do this. So I had to do it myself. I had to pay myself. I did the investment myself. Because I know nobody will take this risk. You know, to do nothing of these traditional technologies anymore and to do such a big building. You know? But I did it. Okay, now I did it because I knew it will work. <laughs> but this was only by chance, you know. But, okay, so that's the, the layout of the building. And then you see that's the site uh, which is too big, but that's the, the, the layout of the building. And you see the layout is very neutral. It has no use. One of the four quarters is about 120 square meters, which is about 1,320 square feet or something like this. And uh, so you can separate the building into different pieces or you can divide the building. Into, into the, and now I will show you afterwards, which is uh, very funny. And you know, when I, I, I want to show you a little bit uh, how we uh, how we, this is the section of the building which is very simple. And now, when we develop a building today, then we speak about three different impacts. The first impact is we start to calculate the building as properly that if nobody ever enters the building, how will be the temperature in the building without any impact from people? On an empty building, and because I, you see the the, line, the green line is always the the inside temperature, the blue lines are always there, and then you see that the behavior of the building is something very important uh, as a starting point, and that's the result of an optimization of the building, that the building will not become that cold and it will not become that warm. Uh, and, thing. and then the next step is when you, uh, and that's in, in all the calculation, in all the standards, what we do nowadays, you have a certain idea of how many people go to this building doing how many hours a day and things like this, and then you become another green line. But this green line is only one of the possible futures. But normally, the standard is always wrong. The reality always will be different. The reality always will be different. Why do I talk about this so much? Because when you do a, a building with quite good technical standards, you will find out that the energy performance of the building is about 20 to 25 percent related to the outside temperature. But 75 percent is related to the ventilation necessities. So, 
In our standards, we are very much focusing on the outside temperature and the relation of, but this is a little bit old-fashioned because we know that the energy performance of the building is determined by 75% by the ventilation necessities. So we have to focus on the way to ventilate the building, you know, to ventilate the building. The outside temperature is, uh, in, on, on, uh, as a, if you do a good building, you have about four watt per square or meter uh, and hour, which you need for compensate the outside temperature. But the overall performance is much higher. The, all the rest is needed for balance the ventilation. Balance the ventilation. So, and then you see that's balancing the ventilation in relation to <coughs> the carbon dioxide levels inside and the outside. It, that's what we are doing with software. So we have. So when you ask me if this is a simple technology, I don't know. Uh, I, in the end, it's a, it's very simple according to the knowledge. But if you don't have the knowledge, it's very complex. So it's a question of software, and so it, that it's a combination of two very important things. One is the materialistic quality of the building, which is represented by the, what happens to the building without any people. And the third one is how can you balance the building by software that the building reacts on the impact of what people bring into uh, the building. So it's a completely decentralized system, and the building behaves in every room very differently. Because according to what happens in the rooms, the building has to... So the building reacts onto the behavior of the people, not anymore the other way around. So it's not about machines, it's not about absolute values, it's only about what is the impact of people onto the building. You know, the, the impact of people, what we people do in a room, is, it's, you can measure in, in three values. You can measure the temperature. You know that you are a heater, everybody of you is a heater of 80 watt per hour. If you want not to be a heater anymore, you have to kill you. <laughs> All the rest of your life, you will heat up the area in which you are. I'm really, so, oh, a lot of people also enjoy this kind of feeling very much. You know. Second is also very simple. We do the opposite of what trees do. We use oxygen and we pro produce carbon dioxide. So we, we waste the air in which we live. So uh, that's the biggest problem. And the third one is also very simple. We sweat a little bit, so the humidity <laughs> will increase, especially in bedrooms. You can see this in the morning. Everybody can experience that the humidity is uh, higher, you know, because you lose about one liter of uh, liquid uh, a day uh, every year. So, and, and that's a little bit the impact what you as a person have onto a building, and the building tries to react on this. Because it's something very different if there's one person or if there are ten persons in the same room, uh, the building has to react very differently, very, very differently. So now I will show you very shortly how the building looks like. That's uh, the building. It, it's, uh, I will show you afterwards. It's built very traditional. It's in concrete slabs and uh, bricks as walls. So that's the most common way how you build buildings in Europe. Use bricks for the walls and uh, concrete for the slabs. That's it. Uh, but modern concrete means pre-stressed, uh, prefabricated elements. I will show you. Should. Second, you see, this is the only technological spe special issue, that's the ventilation of the window, which means the, wind, the building can decide if the building opens himself or it closes himself. That's all. And that's the, the window is something uh, very important. And uh, now that's the building from outside. When you, okay, that's the building uh, from another side. And you know, it was done very tra in, in traditional technologies with bricks, plaster, 
uh, wind, uh, wooden windows, everything local products. You know? So, and I always say if you want to do a cheap building, you always have to use the most common local product. That's always the cheapest. It's always the cheapest, all, all over the world. Then that's, uh, that's, that's another view from outside. That's one of the stairs inside. You know, I, you see, I hope in these images you can see I like modernistic, I like modernism as an architectural attitude, as a way. And you see, that's the, about the services. I can, I can, that's the interior, that's some parts of the interiors. That's the canteen in the building. That's for the employees, the, the, the area for drinking coffee. That's a standard office. That's a, a standard meeting room. You know, I, I like very much a, an, an environment under control. <laughs> Even if it is only my control, but <laughs> doesn't matter. Okay. So I, and you see, I, for, why do I show you this? You know, normally, also in this building, we have servers for our company. And normally, the server is uh, cooled. But we don't cool the server. Because this wall, when you, what you see in the image, is an open uh, wall. And the server is in the back. And the server contributes to the heating of the building. So that's only one of the examples I want to show, show you. Use the things you have, but make it more clever. Make it more clever. You know, I'm so, and that's one of these chairs. Uh, one of these, uh, look, why do I show you this uh, table? This table is massive wood. There is no nail, no screw, nothing. And this table, look, is four, four and a half meters long. And it's only, and sometimes I have the desire that architecture should become as reasonable. And, uh, but when you want to make a table like this, you need a high knowledge. Only when you have a lot of experience, you know, and only when you train yourself very properly, you will be able to do such a simple looking table. You know, but it's very nice that you only need the wood, you need nothing else to do this table. But that's, so you call it simple, okay, I call it, you need a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience, and then you will be able to do this. I show you some of the results. You know, the, the yellow is the energy consumption during one year. And you see that is by nature, that during the year, the energy consumption in winter is higher than in summer because, and that's, but you see on the, on the right hand uh, chart that the energy consumption, what we have is about 30 kilowatt hours per square meter a year. And if you find one building in Canada which is under 100, I congratulate you. I really congratulate you. So everything is optimized in the building. Not only the building itself, every machinery is always the best what you can get in the market with the best performance, best screens, best servers. So everything is optimized. So it's not about waste, so you could do it also very easily. Uh, buy bad computers which have a high electricity. <laughs> range, then the heating will be too warm, but never that. So, but everything is optimized. That's what you see in the overall number. You know, I, I show you something very simple. That's the relation in this side between the, the, the hours of sunshine and, uh, the electri and the artificial light you need. So you see the artificial light, what you need by, by nature, by your design is the heating of the building. So first of all, you would not believe that this is enough. But it is enough. You don't need more. You know? But this means, for example, in design, that you design your building in a way that during quite a long period in the year, you don't need artificial light. 
So the use of the daylight is something so important for the performance. It's not only important for comfort, it's also important for the energetic performance of uh, the building. But you know, when you go, I, I'm, I'm in Toronto, so I say when you go in Europe through modern buildings, you will always see something, or even in summer. They have big glass windows, but you, all the day long, they need artificial light. So they must have been doing something very wrong. And that's the architectural knowledge, how you put the window into the wall, how you, and things like this, that you can have a lot of use of daylight, how, which kind of, sur so it's all about architecture. It's not about engineering, it's about architecture. It's your architectural decisions, what you have to do to, uh, to, to, the, to that your building performs much better. Okay, then I can, I can show you, you see on, on, the, on the right hand side, uh, you can, yes, on the right hand, you see that's the, the red one is the average number for artificial light with calculations which is fixed in the standards in the, in the United States. The green one is in the EU, but the blue one is the one we measure really. So you can optimize on every position of your building. And now I show you uh, some, of the, uh, some of the what happens in, in the building really. So this is uh, one, uh, one, oh yeah, this is uh, one month from April, from 1st of April to 3rd of April. You see the green line, that's the one which is called, why the name is 22, 26. You see all the outside temperature, the blue lines are much deeper. And then you see the red lines, that's the carbon dioxide levels. And you know, this is an off, you see the, the carbon dioxide levels are between 300 and 400. The outside carbon dioxide level in the outside air also in Canada is about 400. So this means I never had been in the office. I always was on my way. The office was nearly empty, but the temperature stayed very stable. You know, I show you another one. Uh, this is now the same one in September, and that's now the same office in January. And then you see the temperatures are minus 5, minus 10 degrees. The green temperature still uh, is there. Now I can show you a, a room with about 6 to 8 people, and there are some additional machinery, printers, and, co and then you see the, the red line is the carbon dioxide level, which means more people, higher carbon dioxide, the building, and then you see almost the sharp falling down of the red line. This means that the building opens himself. And we have one phenomenon. To change the carbon dioxide level, it is a very short time uh, interaction, so when you open the window for five minutes, everything is out. But when you t want to change the temperature, this takes a long time. So the, you can balance the opening and closing of the building uh, very much according to the carbon dioxide level in a short time. You know, I, I, as a, as a, oh, oh, okay, I was, when I re understood that 75% of the energy impact is related to ventilation. I asked myself something very simple. I am producing 80 watt. And for having a good carbon dioxide uh, value, I need about 20 cubic meter of air every, of fresh air every hour. So I asked myself, but when my goal is 22 degrees, and when I want to have 20 cubic meters of air, how much energy potential is in 20 cubic meters of air based on which temperature? So this means I can open the window for this 20 cubic meters out down to which temperature. I can open the window without having any energy loss because I have 80 watts. Some of the bold people have 100, or oh, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's according to the 
Okay, some ladies with, uh, okay. But it can be between 80 and 120, that's it. But I, I tell you, and I know not a lot of people know, but to compensate the, uh, to compensate the temperature of 20 cubic meters of air up to 22 degrees, the outside temperature can be one degree. So when you are able to manage that you don't open, that you don't ventilate more than 20 cubic meters, down to one degree, net mechanical ventilation does not make sense. And heat recuperation, not at all. That's something very strange, you know? Because, at least in Europe, we experience what do people like most? They like most fresh air. What do we do in modern buildings? We tell them not to open the windows. This is ridiculous. But we do this as a society. When we do standards, which make this reasonable. But I tell you, it's not reasonable. Okay, but that's for, a big, uh, that's for another office, uh, you see. And there you see, obviously, then uh, when you have, uh, for example, in this chart, when you have a high, temperature, high carbon dioxide level, window opens immediately, uh, carbon dioxide level goes down immediately again. Because this air exchange is very fast, temperature exchange is very, very low. Now I show you something, <laughs> you know, maybe it's a, a too, too many numbers in this chart. But this is exactly the year 2018, from 1st of January to 31st of December, the, in this office with the people, with the, uh, and then you see the green line. The green line is always in, I'm sorry, is always in the 22, 26. You see the coldest temperature were under minus 12, minus 13 degrees. The highest temperature are about uh, 35 to 36 degrees. The carbon dioxide, you see, when it, you know, in every mechanical ventilated building, you accept by standard all over the world at the moment, 1,500 uh, ppm carbon dioxide. We are always much lower. And that's what people also can feel when they come to this building. They feel much more comfortable. Everybody tells you this because the air quality is much better than in a normal mechanical ventilated building. So, but this is uh, measured every 30 minutes. So this is quite precise uh, for one year. So this is measured every 30 minutes. So, but you know, I, I'm really sorry. I could give you charts like this uh, for hundreds, uh, for, for hours, because uh, the building is in use now for six years. And we measure every room within a time frame of 10 seconds. So we have data, there is no other building in the world where you have so much data about what happens in the building like this one. So we, we don't speak about the building, we speak about every room. Because in every room we need some sensors. You know, we, we measure in every room temperature, carbon dioxide and humidity. And according to this, the software is balancing what to do with the building. So, okay, now I, sh I show you once more how the building is done. So it's, I'm an architect, very simple strategy. Everything which is vertical is brick, everything which is horizontal is concrete. The concrete slabs are, sorry, yeah, no, I have to say here. The concrete slabs are prefabricated, pre-stressed concrete slabs, and there's only about 10 centimeters of local concrete on top of it, you know. The whole building period for the whole building was six months. So it's not that complicated uh, to be built. Now I show you some slides how the building is used today. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, the, there's a yoga studio in the building. There is a marketing company in the building. There is a lighting company in the building. There is a, a, a fitness trainer in the building. There is an apartment in the building. There is an art gallery in the building. So when you want to invent this mixture, you will not be able to. 
but reality can do for you, you know. So make it open, and the, these are the. So what are the big advantages of this one? First, maybe you can imagine that the construction cost is quite low, because all these HVAC installations, which is normally in Europe, in normal buildings between 15 to 20, in uh, more uh, developed buildings between t about 25% uh, to 30, in hospital it's even 40 to 45, uh, you don't have anymore. So, it's, it's, so, but instead we need some better window construction and we need software. But I'm very sorry, we are the owner of the software. I developed myself, you know, to manage this, but that's okay. Uh, but uh, it's able to be bought. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry for this. Uh, now the next one is the, the big, this is the life cycle cost. Now in Europe, they started to develop standards of the, asking the, the self how expensive is a building within a time frame of 50 years. This is a German standard, and they always use this building as reference for their standard because they never found a more efficient building like this. Because in the life cycle cost, all the short-term running machinery you don't have anymore. And this makes the life cycle, the investment in a period of 50 years so low in relation uh, to other buildings. And the third one, that's the one where we started off. The energy consumption is m about 30% of a uh, regular building, of a normal uh, build. You know, the numbers for the regular buildings is not, is not invented and not estimated. There's a lot of research in Switzerland, especially. Uh, this is a number as a result of a study for where they analyzed more than 400 uh, office buildings. So the, the number is quite reasonable, what they gave us. Now I show you, in the last five minutes, I, I want to show you some buildings uh, which are partly uh, using this kind of knowledge. This is a university building in Luxembourg for the government of Luxembourg. 100, it, it's a little bit bigger than it looks like. The tower is 100 meters high and the building is 180 meters long. And this is a, a building for a, a teaching. And this is the first building in Europe where the high, even the high-rise has no mechanical ventilation, no cooling anymore. The only mechanical ventilation in the building we have for six rooms, which are meeting t uh, lecture halls for more than 300 people. All the rest, nothing anymore. No cooling, no mechanical ventilation anymore. It's only a, what we call a backup, a, a emergency heating for bad times that they can control. The other one is, and you know, this is situated in, uh, in Luxembourg, in Esch, and uh, the background of this site is an uh, is, uh, old uh, iron cast uh, area where they produced iron, and uh, yeah. Therefore, the building, you see, that's part of this tr history of the site. Uh, you can see in the foundation, uh, on, on the, I, I always said that I want to keep these foundations as part of the whole at the atmosphere of the university. The, you see, the, you see the, 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 the second, the concrete building is the, 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 the restaurant for the university and in the back is the university. Uh, the, okay, I show you very fast. And you know, according to the site, all the material for the building is very tough. It's only steel and concrete. All the building is has only two surfaces, steel and concrete. Steel, that's the history of the site, and concrete, that's the structural material for the building. That's it. I'm so, so the next building I show you is, is very important for myself. Because this is a client, uh, she is a woman, the owner of a small harbor. 
And I have a very close relation to her, and I did seven projects with her. Every year or every second year, she comes to me and says, mm, I earned a little bit money, what shall we do? Then we build a small project. And uh, this one is the, why this is so important for me, because this one is the first building I dared not to use any technology anymore. And uh, we cannot use this building 360 uh, days a year, but we can use it about 320 days a year. And it's mainly used as a meeting area for the people in the harbor. And now a lot of uh, companies, uh, they always rent this building for their board meetings or special conferences or when they want to retreat a little bit, they go to this very strange atmosphere. Uh, it's not a chapel, I'm sorry, but it's a normal meeting room, but it always looks like a, a chapel. And now, but you see, there the strategy is the same. that. The, the concrete structure is the, the, the structure which, which has to have a high heat capacity to balance the difference between day and night and also during some periods during the year. Now, I'm really sorry that uh, I, don't gave you, I don't give you too many technical details, but I can talk about this for hours, I'm sorry. Uh, but I can want to show you for the end one moment, some other projects, what, sorry, for what we did at the moment, what we built. This is a laboratory building in Liechtenstein with the same technology. This, sorry, this on the right hand side, you see it, uh, the, the headquarters of a building company in, in uh, Switzerland near Lucerne. Uh, th this is uh, in use. Then, yeah, that's the headquarter of the building company. Then this is a very strange building. This is a, a, a building for a medical organization of uh, medical treatment in, low, in, uh, in, uh, in the mountains. You know, so this is a, and in, this is a real mixed use building because the, the top floor is only apartments and the ground floor is an architectural office which I, it's not mine, but I, I like the, the, the two floors in, the, in between. These are for this medical uh, treatment area. This is a small house, uh, which is also based on the same uh, knowledge and technology. This is a building in Hamburg, and uh, this is a, a building in, in Switzerland for the biggest uh, Swiss developers. The building is about 20, 000. Okay, 220,000 square f uh, f uh, feet, and this is, uh, which is under construction at the moment. This is the biggest building what we do at the moment in this direction. The development is 250,000 square meters, which means 2.8 million uh, square feet. Uh, so that's really big in Berlin. This is a, a project in Vienna, uh, in the new part of uh, Aspen, Seestadt. Uh, it's about offices, and what we start, just start to build is uh, to implement this kind of knowledge into social housing. This is uh, about 100 apartments in the same city where we already built our office building. Uh, it's about 100 apartments in the center of the, uh, in the middle city. It's a village. It's something between a village, but that's in the middle. So what we do at the moment is that we adapt this kind of knowledge to a lot of different building typologies in a lot of different sites, but. Uh, you know, there are, would be even more better positions, uh, better areas. For example, to do a building like this in Los Angeles would be perfect because their climate is so nice. To do something in London would be perfect, their climate is so nice. To do something in Hamburg is so perfect, their climate is so nice. Okay, I built in a lot of places, but you know, even when we stress in situations like ours, you know, which 
We have quite a lot of snow in winter, and we have uh, some. Uh, we, we don't have it too warm in summer, you know. But what I want to say, you can use this kind of knowledge in every climate, except the ones where humidity is the key question. Uh, for example, in Hong Kong, the, the humidity would be the, the key question. But in all other climates, you only can talk about uh, which kind of backup or emergency system you would uh, bring into the building to compensate the worst cases. But in, in a lot of climate, there is no necessity for these issues. You know? At the moment, we are working on one issue in Oslo, in Norway, uh, and there the emergency system is about heating. Uh, and we are working on a project in Madrid, and there the emergency system is a little bit about cooling. But you can imagine that these, these systems, they become very, very small. They have nothing to do with traditional technologies anymore, and uh, there are different opportunities uh, to do this. So I know I did not talk to you too much in detail, but uh, I, but I have to apologize for this, but there is so much details behind this, you know, I could talk for, when you want to have any questions, let me know, I will try to, I will try. Three minutes too long, I finish now, thank you very much.